Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. You're watching Indian Open and I'm Neeraj Shah. Good morning, Ira. Good morning, Neeraj, and a very good morning to all of our viewers. Let's get you the headlines as we come back from the midweek holiday. Lenders brace for another hit as the Reserve Bank of India issues a revised framework for bad loan management. Bad loans and provisioning may rise. Fortis Healthcare seeks a 15-day extension to submit its second and third quarter earnings, citing auditors' inability to complete the audit in time. U.S. business may prove to be a drag for Sun Pharma in the third quarter when it comes out with numbers today. And the Asian markets uh, may not be pointing towards it, but the one-day holiday means that we'll start off maybe just maybe slightly higher. The U.S. markets, remember, had a bit of a pullback from the lows. And if you look at the Asian picture, it's a bit of a mixed bag. This is the U.S. markets and don't get fooled by the headline numbers. It may seem flattish, but if, it, if you had looked at the intraday volatility in the U.S. markets, you would have known there's a quite a bit of a pullback from the lows of the day. And maybe that too is helping its hand. The SDX Nifty indicating that we'll start off about about 80 odd points, but I mean, this is an exaggerated number. Uh, mildly in the green is the kind of start that we may have in the session today. And frankly, if you just look at how the trade has been the last couple of days, this wouldn't come as a surprise because it was a relatively strong day of trade on Monday as well. It was a second consecutive day of low volumes, yes, but the trade by and large pointed towards uh, some bit of optimism. In fact, the mid caps and the small caps are over a percent and a half a piece. So the broader market strength was there. And the nifty OI too, people added some bit of long positions to the index predominantly. Uh, and, and that's um, quite a bit really because the last few days, in the first one week of February at least, we've had a positioning of OI unwinding because of the long rollovers that had happened from the Jan series. Uh, high delivery based buying in HDFC Twins, Kotak Bank. Remember, private financials helped the index in a big way. Five or six top index names on the private side went up in the green and quite strongly and there was some heavy delivery based buying they are northwards of 55 percent for all three for the hdfc twins northward of 60 percent as well let's see if the momentum continues in today's session i don't know Ida would have some thoughts here i'll ask her about it but the ip numbers maybe it's a slight tool off in key uh, cpi let's see if all of that only aids sentiment to that yet uh, to, in today's session so to watch out for all of that uh, stocks to watch well, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch uh, came out with the note on Britannia post the numbers. The numbers came out, of course, post market hours as well. They've maintained the buy. But across the board, you will see, I've cited the BOFA ML note as an example of what most brokerages have said post the numbers. Solid Q3, volume growth exceptional, and the EBITDA, the net profit surging and moving ahead of estimates because of the double digit volume growth. So Britannia could well turn out to be a stock to watch out for. KRBL could be a really interesting one. Monish Pabrai, a Pabrai investment fund, has bought about 2.77% stake at 594. The stock is in or around those levels, but Monish Pabrai uh, getting into it could well evoke some response and some extremely strong numbers. There are, it's a mixed bag, really. We'll do an earnings heat map a bit later on. It's a mixed bag uh, in terms of gainers and losers, but two stocks which I thought stood out. One of them was Lumax Auto, the quarter three numbers, margins expanding about about 240 basis points, the profit up 225%. This one could well react to its numbers today. As could Shelly Engineering Plastics. Revenues up 44%, profit up 200%, and the margins moving up around 400 basis points or 350 basis or, or basis points. So this could be another interesting one. No, not 20 microns. Shelly Engineering and Plastics is the one that I'm talking about. That is the one that came out with a very good set of numbers and could well react in the session today. Ida, just before we move on to first word, just a thought on what did you make of the IP CPI numbers as well? Unexceptional, really. Unexceptional. Uh, unexceptional. Uh, they were as expected. CPI, which is the more important number right now to watch for, you know, the expectation was 5.1. You came in a little bit below that. Uh, no dramatic change in trend on the CPI numbers. Uh, and IP also, I mean, you know, uh, strong, slightly lower than last month, but strong. So nothing exceptional. You haven't, I mean, you didn't think too much of the manufacturing uh, growth numbers. Uh, they've been strong. I mean, capital course. goods have been not powerful. Of course, they're good. They're certainly good, but uh, they uh, they didn't change trend. Uh, they didn't change trend for me. Uh, not on CPI, not on IIP. So you know, uh, as expected, more or less. Okay. Fair call. So let's tell you what's lined up on first word today. Now we'll. Actually, two major things or one major thing. We'll speak to the chairman of the Indian Banks Association to get his reaction on the RBI's move to overhaul the entire bad loan framework. Uh, so that's really the big discussion. What also, also doing really well in Friday's session were the tyre stocks and we'll tell you all that's happening within that pocket uh, and what could be the way ahead for these tyre stocks as well. But yeah, the big one, 
yeah. overall. Yeah, this was a big one. It came in uh, late on Monday evening. We were just about getting home and suddenly uh, there was this large notification from the RBI which took a while to get through. Uh, but it's a massive and a complete overhaul. Uh, you know, first things and before we get into uh, the details, uh, you know, kudos uh, to the central bank for actually going ahead with this uh, at a time when there's a lot of pain. So, uh, you know, a lesser uh, uh, central bank would have said that let the banking system get over this pain and then, you know, we'll hit them with uh, the big one. Uh, but they have been unrelenting on this clean up and you know kudos to them for that but let's tell you what exactly uh, is there in this particular uh, circular well most of the existing stressed asset schemes uh, the alphabet soup as it's been often called is uh, over and done with so there's no SDR there's no CDR there's no S4A there's no flexible restructuring uh, of long-term loans there's no joint lenders forum as well that too uh, has been done away with uh, instead what banks have is a very strict reporting uh, and resolution framework so firstly banks have to report a default in all accounts above five crore on a weekly basis to Krilk. This is still not public reporting. Uh, this is the uh, central repository of large uh, credit database uh, which is uh, circulated within banks and the RBI has access to it. So you have to report every default uh, of uh, 5 crore and above to that on a weekly basis. They have strictly defined default as well uh, in their guidelines. Uh, beyond that, as soon as there is a default event, banks will be given 180 days to try and finalize a resolution plan uh, for assets above 2,000 crore. Uh, if banks fail to do so, uh, then they have 15 days within which they have to refer uh, the account to IBC. Uh, those are some of the big headlines. You can go to BloombergQuinn.com uh, to read more details on it. But what are the implications of this? Uh, it seems that the key implications, one, is that if restructuring has not been completed under these schemes that we just mentioned, if it is still underway, uh, then bankers will have to go back to the drawing board and try and uh, rework a restructuring scheme under now the new guidelines. Uh, there is an expectation that you could see non-performing loans start to rise and they'll rise to match uh, the overall all stressed asset level. Remember, stressed assets is NPLs plus restructured, etc. So uh, the expectation is NPLs will rise closer to the overall stressed asset pool. Uh, provisionings may rise as well. And some people talk about the fact that if a large number of accounts go into the IBC, uh, there could be steeper haircuts and there could be uh, the risk of liquidation, which also increases. Let me go across uh, to Mr. Viji Kannan, CEO of the Indian Banks Association. He's joining us over the phone. Very good morning to you, Mr. Kannan. Thanks for taking our early morning call. Uh, so you've all had about 24 hours or so, a little bit more than that to look look through uh, the guidelines. My first question to you, sir, is, uh, you know, the assumption being made is that this is a stricter set of rules and you will probably see reported non-performing assets rise towards the stressed asset, overall stressed asset level. Uh, is that a fair assumption to make, sir? I think the stressed assets level will not in increase. Uh, I think most of the banks have been uh, identifying stressed assets of accounts which have been uh, in default for more than uh, 10 days, 15 days, one month, two months, and they have been monitoring this. So for the stress asset level will not increase. Uh, what will happen actually is the effort to go about uh, doing a resolution. That will uh, happen. And uh, I feel uh, in a way, instead of having the um, straight jacketed certain uh, specific schemes, this particular resolution plan, though it has a timeline of 180 days, is totally free for the bank and the promoter to come with any proper resolution process. Therefore, in a way, this is also relaxation that you know, no strict guidelines have been put uh, regarding uh, sustainable debt, non-sustainable debt, or the SGR, the change of promoter. So a lot of flexibility has been given. I mean, this is 180 days timeline, and uh, the uh, dropping of the JLF is something to be uh, thought about. Uh, sir, I understand that the overall stressed asset level won't rise, but won't the NPA numbers within that stressed asset pool rise? Because, for instance, if accounts were in SMA2, they were 60 days overdue. Now, under this new framework, unless a resolution plan can actually be finalized, uh, those will go into NPA quite rapidly, and the uh, you know the benefit under certain restructuring schemes like SDR will not exist. See, although the account goes into default, if the account has been regularized, uh, within the period, it doesn't necessarily have to go through a resolution plan. The resolution plan is to ensure that in case the stress is going to continue, you cannot have a temporary uh, relief. And a long-term uh, solution will be found. And I think uh, this is supposed that a particular account, in my own, uh, it's uh, my assumption, in case an account becomes a default in say, one week, and uh, he comes to the plan saying, I'm getting the money within a week. It's not a full-fledged plan. And unless... Uh, Restructuring of the uh, uh, what do you call the loan proposal take place, then uh, and that, there won't be any impact. Uh, resolution plan could be simply a simple thing like um, only regularizing the account. 
But what I'm looking at is in case a restriction takes place, then that has to take place within 180 days. All the documentation has to be done within 180 days. And then thereafter, um, he, he, he can go ahead. Feasible, uh, do you think it is, sir, uh, that 180-day period within which uh, banks have to find a resolution plan? And also, uh, they don't specify that the, the, the guidelines seem to suggest that all bankers have to be on board. And a couple of people told us that in history, we've never found a scenario uh, where all bankers in a large case have come on board that quickly. Yeah, I think uh, that, that could be a major issue, uh, getting all the under, uh, 100% bankers. But having said that, I think the... Uh, more a case of uh, interbank discipline as to uh, uh, take it forward will come and better things should prevail for them to come back to a solution immediately. So hitherto there is no penalty or anything for the bankers. So that could be a dealing tactics. Now under the new circumstances, the borrower also will probably be very keen with all the um, uh, bankers with whom he had relationship. Uh, in the uh, form of uh, financing the project, we will probably try to rally them around for talk solution. Uh, so two qu uh, quick questions. One is on provisioning. Again, the assumption being made is that if a larger number of accounts move into the IBC, uh, provisioning requirements will be higher. So far, you know, haircuts have been relatively steep uh, from the early experience in the IBC. Would you agree, sir? Uh, I won't say uh, right now the haircuts all depends on how the haircuts is going to pan out in the a new uh, series. But yes, uh, the overall provisioning will have to increase because uh, in the event of a default, there's a probability of a uh, resolution plan coming. If the resolution plan comes, then you, the account gets categorized under NPA. And then subsequently, if it, uh, the uh, resolution plan doesn't happen within 180 days, then it, it may go to IBC. And there again, 50% uh, provision might kick in. So all this could lead to a higher provisions. But uh, we, we do feel that um, this could send a signal to the uh, borrowers and the bankers that they, they have to be very careful in the projections. Uh, so, let's see how it uh, uh, pans out going forward. Last question, sir. Uh, anything else that stood out to you as something that banks may find uh, tough to implement? Uh, I also point to the fact that they have to now report to Krilk every default above 5 crore. I don't know if that's a precursor to a public uh, acknowledgement of default as well or not. Uh, but that or anything else, sir, that you think needs to be re-looked at? The reporting of the uh, transaction uh, of the uh, accounts to the Krilk uh, was being done on a quarterly level for the uh, uh, transaction above 5 crores. But me? Issue is going to be whether many of the banks are prepared to do it on a weekly basis. Uh, my assumption is if they're in a position to do it quarterly, I think uh, why not even monthly and why not even weekly for the uh, short period. So that could be an immediate concern, um, but they have been given a week's time. They only have to tweak it and see that the data is collected and, and sent over. So I think uh, that could be a minor uh, uh, irritant, uh, which could possibly be overcome. That's the only thing I feel. All right, Mr. Kanan, really appreciate this call uh, early morning to help us understand this better. That's uh, the CEO of the Indian Banks Association. Now, Ira, for the benefit of uh, a lot of people who are watching this right now, what's the difference between now or what will happen henceforth versus all the options that were available and what was happening? Would this, to your mind and based on your conversation, lead to some near-term hiccups on the reported NPAs by banks in the immediate next two or three quarters? Uh, I think the general impression is that it will. Uh, probably the next two or three quarters, not like immediately. But uh, I mean, Mr. Kanan didn't agree with that. But what analysts are generally speaking of is the fact that, uh, look, there is a stressed asset pool, uh, which uh, NPAs are currently about 10, 10 and a half percent of overall assets. Mm. Uh, over and above that, there was, you know, the restructured pool, which took it to about 12 percent of total assets. And then over and above that, there were about three and a half percent of advances, which were in what is known as SMA2. That's the accounts that are overdue by 60 to 90 days mm. uh, before they turn NPA. Uh, so I think the assumption is that some some of these assets which may have been able to get the benefit by getting restructured under say long term structuring uh, program for you know the 525 what we used to call it uh, or SDR will not have that benefit any anymore so hence they will start to move into the NPA pool uh, so you know there is the NPA pool uh, there is a stressed asset pool so the assumption is that the NPA number would move closer to the stressed asset number okay. uh, so there is that assumption being made I don't know if that's true like he was saying that if they manage to come up with a restructuring plan and it gets uh, you know restructured 
restructured, then it's fine. A resolution plan, not restructuring plan, a resolution plan, and it gets resolved, uh, then it's fine. Uh, but will they be able to do that? We don't know. And then there is this you know, uncertainty about the fact uh, that they've said all banks have to agree, or they haven't like specified. Earlier it was 60, first it was 75, then it was brought down to 60% of the bankers have to agree. No, this sorry, for what? For a resolution plan. Okay, fine. Huh. Uh, you know, because the problem with these consortium loans is some okay, of these okay. uh, hmm. consortiums have 20, 24 banks, right? To get all of them to agree, to go to their boards, get a sign-off within the required time was just a huge headache which never happened. So in some of these earlier schemes, what they had, what the RBI had said was that you have to get approval of 60% of the bankers or 75% of the debt. Um, I may have those exact numbers slightly off, uh, but essentially it wasn't some all majority, banks. Huh. Hmm. Uh, and now there doesn't seem to be a distinction. So if you know you have to get all banks on board within that 100. 180 day period will you be able to do it or not uh, so I think that is some uh, there's some ambiguity plus as you get into IBC provisions uh, will certainly uh, arise okay and, and one more question you know uh, I, I remember some conversations with analysts and and bankers not necessarily the CEO but the people below and they were saying uh, private bankers would say that you know it's slightly unfair to us the previous mechanism as well because we have good relationships with promoters and you know, even if the promoter is not paid right now, at some point of time they will. Now, does this make that job even tougher because of the stringent rules that are now there in the timelines that have been reduced? Yeah, that should have ended a long time back. This yes. relationship banking, as it used to be called. Huh. Uh, but yeah, no, the, they actually, if you look through the whole set of guidelines, you know, it's very prescriptive. Uh, they go into the extent of saying what to our mind constitutes stress and they whole, you know, lay out a whole set of okay. things which they think is stress. Uh, what in, entails resolution? Uh, they lay out a whole set of things there. They go on to say, one specific point is that you know if within that period 180 day period or whatever uh, or within the resolution period uh, there is a default event then it automatically should go to NP it's a very prescriptive set of guidelines mm. uh, you know one could argue that maybe you know regulator shouldn't be that prescriptive but given the experience of the last uh, you know few years uh, I think it was completely justified I just want to put up one quote uh, this is you know a quote from Ikra uh, the reason I'm putting it up is that they, you know they put out some specific numbers so it's worth looking at the numbers that they put out and they're the only ones who put out these numbers uh, they say that according to them about 50 large borrowers have banking exposure of 2000 crore or more and will need resolution by 1st September 2018 the total borrower, uh, borrowings of these companies stands at about 2.46 lakh crore of debt. Some of these accounts are already classified as NPAs and may not add to the overall stock of NPAs. However, if the resolution plan entails restructuring of loans, the standard loans may get uh, classified as NPAs. Also, if the resolution plan fails, the banks will need to initiate proceedings under IBC. So they're just giving you a sense uh, of the pool that is first at risk uh, under this new framework. Okay, I have one last question, uh, and that is... Uh there's some talk of how, because of this mechanism being so stringent, there would be some unintended beneficiaries as well. So maybe ARC companies uh, might be able to get some benefits or maybe credit rating agencies because of an assumption yeah. that there'll be a need to independent credit valuation of residual, de residual debt and uh, debt and that will increase the business for the credit rating agencies. But that they had said earlier also. I mean, okay. even in the earlier framework, they had said that, uh, you know, you need to have credit rating agencies come up and uh, rate a resolution plan so now they are saying that before it gets upgraded you have to ensure that it's investment grade etc in large cases it's two credit racing agencies that these are sidebars, I mean, yeah, <laughs> they're entirely sidebars. ARC, yes. Yeah. ARC, yes. I mean, you know, of course, if all of these accounts start to go into IBC, maybe ERCs have, you know, more business to get into um, all assumptions. And then we also, as we have said, you have also agreed in the past, that we don't know how this ARC business is going to play out. Is it going to give the kind of returns or not? But, you know, sidebars. Sidebars. <laughs> All right, we will, uh, you know, end this conversation for now. Uh, but we've got a conversation coming up with Sanjeev Sanyal, uh, the principal economic advisor to the government. Slightly more macro view on this NPA battle that's coming up at 9:30. Okay. Now, um, let, let me uh, try and delve into the more mundane matters, if you will, compared to what we just discussed. But hey, you know, while while all that is happening in the banking space, I also need to focus on a couple of pockets that have been doing well. I'm just trying to get. Uh, that mail and tell you um, what within the tire space could be doing well. Now, this is what the tire companies did on Friday era. Seat up 4%, MRF 2.5%, Apollo tires up 1.5%. And as then I was trying to think as to what could be the reasons why suddenly, as, as, as a group, the tire stocks have moved up, not just on Fridays, not just on Monday session, excuse me, yesterday's holiday made me think it was Friday, not just on Monday session, but otherwise. Now, what's driving the gains? Uh, there have been strong volume growth posted 
post several quarters of not such strong volume growth by almost all the tyre companies. The strong CV demand seems to be driving the volumes for almost all of the tyre stocks. The truck business and the CV sales by companies like Ashok Leyland, Tata Motors, testimony to that fact that those numbers are going up and therefore maybe the volumes are coming up for some of the tyre companies as well. Let me try and give you a glimpse of what's the revenue growth for the last four or five quarters looking like and it'll give you an estimate. It's a price and a volume growth that is coming in for tyre companies. So MRF, I've chosen two companies, MRF and Seat here. Look at MRF. Quarter three, there was a degrowth. Quarter four, there was a degrowth quarter one about 2.4 percent quarter two came back 10 percent but look at this bar here 19.6 percent revenue growth for mrf now take a look at Seat as well and you will see i would believe a similar picture yes look at that q3 q4 q1 in fact q2 for mrf wasn't probably as strong as well but 6.7 percent stark difference to these three and then look at what's happened in q3 fy18 12 percent growth so certainly the revenue growth has shot up for almost all of the tire companies so that is one. Two, it's not just the top line growth number that is helping uh, the companies. I think uh, the raw material cost pressures have eased as, eased as well. And we'll get you a next set of graphics as well to show you really what's happening there. Um, there is lag effect of price hikes showing. So that is one. Um, so volumes were good. Now there are price hikes. And the margins have been the highest in the last four quarters, of at least for almost all of these names. So for some companies, uh, the margins are better in the last six quarters or so anything that they posted in the last six quarters. I think for Apollo, it's in the last four quarters. See it in the last five quarters. So it's, it's doing really well. And, and look at what's happening here. I mean, uh, aside of other things, we've been talking about the factors at play. Uh, I've chosen Apollo Tires as an example. The other companies could not have such a strong correlation, co could have a better correlation. But look at this. Uh, this is the Brent oil chart. And this is the Apollo Tires uh, chart as well. And you will see a direct correlation. Brent moving up. The stock price is coming off. In the last few days, when oil has cooled off, the tire stocks have moved up. So this is Apollo tires and crude oil, the correlation thereof. Even on the operational front, there is a direct correlation, naturally so. It's because of the operational numbers coming off uh, that, uh, uh, or the operational costs coming down that the tire stocks are moving up. Similarly, rubber as well. You will see a similar pattern here. Whenever the rubber prices have fallen, the tire stocks have done well. And again, in the last few days, when rubber has gone down, the tire stocks have moved up. So all is looking well for now. And I looked at analyst reports, and most of them have to say a couple of things that uh, because of uh, this synchronized volume as well as a margin uptick, the tire stocks seem to be in a good framework as of now. Q4 will tell us more if there are some pressures or no, but the strong demand and the high utilization are conducive for price hikes. In fact, if I'm not wrong, a couple of players have already undertaken price hikes, but because companies are trading at peak capacity utilization, there is not excess capacity coming in. Chinese imports are banned. There is some duty out there. All of these lead to some good ground for the tire companies to even hike prices a little bit and gain more to offset any kind of pressure that could have come in in the current quarter because of crude or rubber or that may come in as well. So all is hunky-dory for now. Companies are doing well. Brokeries across the board have given a thumbs up to almost all the three results that have come out till now. It'll be really interesting to see what happens during the course of the current quarter and how do companies mitigate any kind of cost pressures increase that could come about if they come about in the first place. But the going gets, seems to be good for the tyre companies. Good stuff. Uh, tyres and why they're moving up and why the volumes are strong. Neeraj explaining that. That's uh, all the time we have on First Word. Just flagging or what's coming up over the rest of uh, the show. We've got markets and macros discussed with Harsha Upadhyay of Kotak Mahindra Asset Management. Uh, decoding Madhasam Sumi's Q3 performance with Chairman Vivek Chand Segal. Uh, and we review Visaka Industries December quarter earnings as well. All that after a short break uh, and a tilt towards the market. Welcome back. You're watching Indian Open on Bloomberg Quint. Let's see how the Asian markets are doing at this point of time. Most of the Asian markets are trading with the negative bars. The Nikkei is down almost 135 points. That's down six tenths of a percent. The Hong Kong market, surprisingly, are trading with the positive bias. Shanghai is trading absolutely flat. The SDX50 is indicating a gap up of 82 points. But remember, yesterday we were shut in the markets. Uh, the SDX50 was down almost uh, 60 points yesterday. So expect a gap up opening, no doubt. It will be a gap up opening of uh, 20, 25 points. Uh, but that's all we can expect, not this 78 point uptick that we're seeing. But uh, Namneet joins us uh, right now. Namneet, uh, the FNOQs, what are they indicating at this point of time? 
Good morning to both of you, Dashan and Neeraj. Well, we definitely started the week on a very positive note. If you look at the Nifty futures for the second straight session, there was a build-up on the long side, which we saw 5% higher for Nifty uh, futures. The premium was almost three points. Remember, the premium in the last three days has been hovering between discount and premium. Well, have bank Nifty futures, which were active actually, but we didn't see any major build-up coming about. So just about flattish. However, the futures premium closed uh, with about four points. Pull up the India VIX. Now, remember, this has been a concern uh, for our markets. The India volatility index has been going up, but in the last few sessions, we've seen some cool off coming about. So 17.8 was the level where India VIX closed with cuts of 7%. And even in the US, CBOE volatility index has been coming off. So that's one positive sign for the global markets as well. Let's just check how the options data panned out. Well, on uh, Monday's session, we did see some call riding. Remember the green bars are your call strikes. So there was some call riding seen for the 10,700, 10,600 uh, 600 strike and some unwinding for the 10,005 and the 400 strike. Similarly, the lower level strikes, 500 and 400 put strikes saw some open interest addition. Remember, the SGX Nifty suggesting a gap up opening and those levels are somewhere about the 50 day moving average. So in today's session, do watch out for 50 DMA for both Nifty as well as Bank Nifty. Quickly, I'll tell you what the institutions have done. FIs have been selling in the cash segment for the last five to six sessions. And similar is the picture for the index futures. They've been shorting more of index futures. So look at uh, the the short side, almost 18,000 contracts were added, whereas on the option side, there was some unwinding of short positions seen for the likes of put longs, where unwinding of almost 12,500 contracts was seen, and similar was the case for the call short. Uh, in terms of stock futures, what's going to be in focus, uh, the new stocks in band period are Dish TV and JP Associates. Remember, we highlighted both these stocks for you on the closing show. And one stock which has also come out of the FNO ban is Gen Irrigation, so do watch out for all these stocks in today's session. Back to you guys. Thanks for that, Namneet. I think we highlighted gen irrigation uh, on Monday's session in, at about 3.10 as well. So some interesting um, moves could be anticipated there. You know, just looking at uh, what happened in Friday's session, almost all of the commodity-based names did, did okay. Actually, at least the steel companies did really, really well for themselves in the session today, led predominantly by what happened on the earnings front. But is, that's not all. I mean, what's happening to the commodity space by and large? We had a holiday yesterday, but the global markets were still active. Let's get in Jayesh Kilnani who joins us with all the action in the commodity space and the updates thereof. Good morning, Jayesh. What's standing out? Morning, Neeraj. Uh, so two factors playing for the commodity space. Uh, one is the dollar index and the other one uh, for the oil markets is the inventory data that we are expecting later today. Uh, but let me start off with the base metal space. Uh, the LME index itself uh, ended about, uh, almost 2% higher. As far as individual uh, base metals are concerned, we saw that uh, copper, zinc and nickel gained more than 2% each, while lead and tin gained um, uh, you know, nearly 2% each. Now, the primary rise uh, for uh, the uh, zinc market is uh, the analyst comment which is uh, you know they're saying that uh, the zinc market will uh, likely remain tight in 2018 and that's the reason we saw a surge in zinc prices moving on to the precious metal space we are seeing some bit of uptick come about for comics gold which has been trading with a positive bias for the last three days now primarily on the back of dollar index which has aided to the growth of uh, both the base metals and precious metal uh, the dollar index is trading negative for the third consecutive session Lastly, for the oil prices, we are seeing some bit of dip come about for WTI. Uh, mind you, WTI has been trading below the key 60 per barrel mark for the fourth consecutive session on the back of uh, you know, uh, inventory data that is likely to be reported uh, later, uh, later in the day. So we are expecting uh, crude inventory to jump as much as 4 million barrels for last week as per uh, API data. And lastly, the gasoline inventory is likely to expand about 4.5 million barrels for last week, that too, as per API data. Mm. Okay, Jaysh, uh, we'll watch out for all of that. Thanks much for joining in and giving us that perspective. So that's essentially what's happening in the commodity space. You know, it was interesting, Darshan, uh, Friday's session, while the private banks were the principal gainers, mm. and it'll be interesting to see what happens to some of the banking names in today's session, but the mid-cap space had some really strong uh, moves, 1.6% apiece for both yes. the key indices, and a lot of stocks flying around. I mean, stocks like Jaycomar Infra up 14%, LNT Tech up 12%. The strong buoyancy at the broader end of the yeah, spectrum. Yeah, so that, that is there, and you know, today also, you know, a lot of mid caps will be in focus. Obviously, LNT Tech, uh, the rally continued to post a strong set of numbers. Jaycomar Infra came out with a strong set of numbers. I'll really watch out for India Bulls real estate today. Why you so? know, yeah, because uh, they had indicated that today the board meet is there when they will consider the demerger of their commercial real estate and. Uh, you know their uh, their uh, their rental their their uh, 
uh, residential real estate. So they want to demerge it, and then there were news of you know uh, a large PE fund coming into the company. So the board meet is there today. The counter has been a marked out performer ever since uh, they put out on the exchange. The counter has moved up almost 30, 35, 40 rupees. So um, among the stronger real estate names, uh, DLF no doubt disappointed with the numbers, but uh, India Bulls real estate seems so to be going. So what will happen today in the board meeting, or what could happen today in the board meeting? Yeah. So board meeting, they they had indicated earlier that you know they want to demerge their business uh, uh, on the commercial side uh, because uh, uh, the commercial business is basically controlled by the Singapore entity. Uh, so they want to demerge it so that you know they could be shareholder value creation. So that will be interesting. The board meet is there today. So once the outcome comes in, whether any kind of private equity guy comes in or no, uh, it will be interesting to watch that. So India Bulls real estate certainly is on the top of my list today. Okay, so let's wait and watch for that. In fact, let's get in Gorang Shah. He's head investment strategist at Geojit Financial Services. He joins us on the show. Gorang, good morning. Thanks much for joining in. Well, we'll talk about the larger market implications and the IBA rule and the banking resolution, so on and so forth. But since we're in the topic of India Bulls real estate, let me jump straight to the gun and get your thoughts here. Have you guys been tracking India Bulls real estate? Are you looking forward to the board meeting today? Morning, Neeraj. Uh, well, uh, this one is not within the universe of real estate that we cover, but we definitely have some four or five names uh, which we are extremely positive on as far as the real estate pack is concerned. And we've been advising our clients, Neeraj, that if you're dipping into the real estate sector, uh, despite the fact the companies would be sound and credible enough, uh, primary reason that it is associated with the real estate sector, there could be you know high volatility since the entire sector is high beta. Okay. Uh, so that's the view on real estate. Uh, Gorang, while we are on the topic of mid caps and small caps, did you get a chance to look at the numbers, uh, some of the numbers that came out? You know, Jay Kumar Infra, for example, the stock was up about 13, 14% ahead of the numbers. The numbers that came out, I thought optically looked okay. Again, don't know if the company is within your coverage universe. Well, it was uh, some time back at okay. about 150, 160 Neeraj, and uh, you know, the stock has more than doubled from the target prices of not more than doubled, it has more than doubled since the time we initiated the coverage. Our targets were somewhere close to about 220-230. Uh, all I can say is after the number which you also read is that uh, those with uh, a little bit of high risk appetite can definitely continue to hold on to J. Kumar. Those who don't have a high risk appetite and wanting to book out and as an alternative preferred infrastructure play, I would recommend Sadbhav. I would recommend KNR Construction, PNC Infra, Capacity Infra. Uh, you know, primary Jeev Kumar Infra, if you remember, uh, Neeraj, there were certain issues also when it came to execution of certain projects in Maharashtra, especially in Mumbai. Uh, of course, uh, the slate has come clean after that, but uh, you know, I would say that the risk reward for new investment is not favorable at current levels. Okay, Gaurang, hi, Darshan here. Uh, what did you make of uh, Madhusan Sumi's number? It's been a while since Madhusan Sumi disappointed as far as their financials were concerned. So it's a, it's a weak Q3. But uh, overall, what should one do with Madhusan Sumi? So, Darshan, over here again, I think 175, 200, we initiated the coverage. Uh, and this is a time when that entire European business for uh, Madhusan Sumi and uh, Bharat Force, the U.S. business was on a slow wicket, uh, given the you know issues with the economy and the orders that were on the downtake. But post that, I think the company has managed to you know recover and rediscover itself, uh, reinventing via acquisition, and uh, you know justifying uh, their presence in the domestic and global markets. I agree that you know numbers would look a little bit uh, disappointing, and even what estimates one had. Uh, they were a little bit down, but I believe that this is only a short to medium term issue. I was listening into the management commentary and their vision for 2020 and beyond, and I'm quite excited. And you know, the verbatim shared by the management as far as their vision is concerned and the business strategy is concerned, Darshan, uh, our confidence has only got reinforced. And we believe that uh, Madras Sumi, Bharat Forge, Mahindra CIE Automotive, Excite, Amara Raja Batteries, and almost all the companies in the tire gamut. Uh, uh, we are extremely bullish on and it gives us no reason why we should not be positive on auto ancillary tire manufacturing or OEM companies uh, given the fact that we are extremely positive on the entire automobile universe as well. Okay.
Narang, stay on. So much more to talk about. Uh, but let's talk about all the things that you should be watching out for with our research huddle. But before we do that, uh, also talk about the last Nifty company to come out uh, with its uh, earnings, and that is Sun Pharma and Dashan. Uh, what should one watch out for? Yeah, so basically, I think most of it is priced in because Tarot came out with its numbers and they were extremely disappointing. But I think it, it's away from the numbers what's uh, going to happen to Sun Pharma stock because the Halol inspection is currently on. But we need to stick with numbers. As far as the numbers are concerned, we are seeing a revenue uh, degrowth of 12%. We are seeing profits down almost 45%. EBITDA down almost uh, 38%, which means that uh, the margins will come in close to 22% versus 31%. That was their last time around. Now, Taro came out with its numbers, extremely disappointing set of numbers. It's a large chunk, 50% of the US sales, 15% of their overall sales. So that will be definitely factored in. But what happened was in the last quarter, there were a lot of booking, but they could not get in, uh, uh, in, in the second quarter. So these deferred sales will come in into the third quarter. So that is uh, where revenues will start picking up. Uh, it's a seasonally strong quarter for their subsidiary, DUSA. Uh, they have uh, launched uh, Corex CR uh, that, that will aid revenues for the company. Company, uh, re entry of some of the older product, products, the uh, market share gain in Gleevec. So, these are some of the comp uh, factors that will aid the top line of the company. But nevertheless, pricing pressure will be there, competition will be there, and that is why if you are seeing a 30 to 35 percent degrowth on their US business on a year on year basis. And on the India business, the domestic sales are expected to grow on the back of a low base last time around. So, we are seeing close to a double digit uh, growth that could come in on, uh, on Sun Pharma's domestic business. So, that's what uh, expected uh, from Sun Pharma. Uh, Gorang, any view on Sun Pharma? Most of it is factored in because of the tarot numbers. Uh, what did you make of Sun Pharma? What do you expect for Sun Pharma? So, Darshan, uh, disclosure, we maintained a positive coverage, but over the last three quarters, uh, we have uh, turned our coverage into reduce or sell on rally. Uh, this is primarily because of the biggest disappointment, as you were rightly mentioning, from tarot's side. And remember, Taro gave disappointing performance not only for this quarter, but even the last quarter, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there was major disappointment. And the company is in the news because of the ongoing Halol uh, inspection. Uh, I think it may take about a week or 10 days, I don't know, for the inspection to get over and possibly come out with the report uh, which the US of FDA would feel appropriate. And remember one thing, I believe this is the second or the third uh, reinspection at Halol because the last ones did not really materialize and there were repeated observations and uh, issues that came in the spotlight. Uh, I would, and not to forget, from I think 400, 450, the stock has rallied to I think somewhere close to about 600 as of Monday's closing, correct me if I'm wrong again. And we don't believe that there is uh, enough credible uh, evidence for us to, you know, reverse our coverage from sell or reduce or rally to maybe a buy or neutral. Uh, we prefer names like Natco, Aurobindo, uh, Strides, Dashun, uh, Cipla, uh, Alchem Laboratories, Ajanta Pharma. Uh, uh, these are, we believe, uh, better names in terms of uh, return on investments. We would, and of course, you know, Darshan, we would wait for the uh, outcome of the Halol inspection as well and then possibly take a call again. Gaurang, yeah, yes, you're absolutely right. It's the second or third time that uh, Halol has been inspected, but uh, they haven't got success. But uh, just hold on, uh, Gaurang, we have a research team waiting uh, by. Lots of numbers came out uh, after market hours. The big nifty company that came out after num after market hours uh, on Friday was Gale, which, which disappointed with numbers. There are lots of other stocks that you need to watch out for. Some news, some results. Uh, so there's Swamit Shraddha and Nikki that joined me on uh, the huddle right now. Uh, Swamit, let's start uh, with you first. Uh, what did you make of Gale's number? Pretty weak set of numbers, but what were the key reasons? So if you see uh, the numbers were, a weak, uh, were weak that Gale reported in the third quarter of financial year 2018. Now if you see the headline numbers, revenue though revenue was up by 16%, EBITDA and EBITDA margins have contracted and fell down. Now net profit also fell down by around 4%. On the operational side, if you see the gas transmission volumes were up by around 3%, but pet chem volumes remained flat. Five key takeaways from these earnings. Now the operational, uh, operationally, the numbers were below estimates because of higher employee costs and higher other expenses. However, on the bottom line front, the numbers were largely in line because of significantly lower interest cost and marginally higher other income. On the volume front, the gas transmission volumes surprised positively, led by increased offtake by, from power plants due to lack of coal supply, while the pet chem volumes remain muted. Now, analysts were expecting the pet chem volumes to come in at around 1,85,000 metric tons, but the company reported a number of 1,76,000 metric tons.
metric tons. However, now if you see the brokerage view, Motilal Oswal, Antic and City have maintained their stance, but IDBI has downgraded the stock to accumulate, uh, citing a potential limited upside. Now, lastly, the company has also declared an interim dividend of 7.65 rupees per share and a bonus issue in the ratio of 1 is to 3. Okay, so Gail, a weak set of numbers uh, that were reported, but Shraddha, which are the stocks that uh, we need to watch out today? Uh, Rashan, to start off with Indoco Remedies, uh, they have received eight observations from the US FDA for their Goa plant. Uh, on the looks of it, not uh, very uh, severe, but we could see some negative reaction coming in. Piramal Enterprises, they will transfer their assets and liabilities to unit Piramal Finance for about 1900 crores. You have a PTI report which says that Puravankara is looking to create a 2000 crore real estate fund to develop affordable housing, so let's see how that reacts. Uh, Precision Camshafts is another one, uh, a relatively smaller name, not too much in terms of volumes traded as well, but uh, they have received multiple orders worth 275 crores. You could see some positive reaction there. Rolta India, which has signed a pact to restructure dollar bonds, which are due in 2018 and 19. You also have a mint report which says that Max Life has emerged as a front runner to buy IDBI Federal Life, 51% stake there, so watch out for Max uh, uh, Life uh, and uh, also the likes of IDBI and Federal. You have Fortis Healthcare, a multiple news flow there. Uh, they have signed an agreement to buy all the assets of RHT Health Trust, which they had uh, proposed earlier, uh, but they're going ahead with it now. And the enterprise value will be 4650 crores. That apart, they've also formed a panel to oversee strategic and operational functions of the company. You have CG Power. They will hel uh, sell their hungry business, excluding uh, switch gears for 38 million euros. Again, this was announced earlier, but will be executed now. So the a uh, fund flow will come in right now and lastly KRBL uh, where um Munish Pabrai's uh, Pabrai Investment has bought 2.7% stake in the company in a bulk deal on uh, Monday. Okay, so uh, Rolta, KRBL, Crompton Greaves, Power, all these stocks will be in focus today. And Nikki, a lot of numbers came out after market hours. There was a holiday also yesterday. So lots of numbers. Uh, which were the key strong numbers and weak numbers? So I've picked up six set of numbers, okay. uh, four uh, good set of numbers, and we have two uh, weak numbers. To begin with, we have Lumex Auto, where the company has reported a good uh, three-fold jump in its net profit at a number of 13 crore as compared to 4 crore. EBITDA is up by 65% year-on-year basis for this company. Uh, Cost-saving techniques, higher other income and lower finance costs has <coughs> worked well for the company on the bottom line performance. Dollar industry, yet again, strong show on operational front has percolated down in the bottom line performance of the company. Net profit has uh, uh, jumped three-folds uh, at 18 crore as compared to 6 crore in the corresponding quarter. And EBITDA is almost up two-folds at a number of 37 crore as compared to 17-odd crore. Next on the list, we have NHP Q3, uh, good show there, higher incentive uh, income, lower the expenses and saving in interest costs has led to good show on the bottom line front. Net profit is almost uh, tripled by, uh, to 688 crore as compared to a number of 215 crore for this company. Shelly Engineering Plastic, again a good set of number coming in from the company. Revenue up by 44%, uh, net profit up by 200% uh, and EBITDA year on year basis has increased by 86%. In week set, we have Manglam cement now remember it's hit by the pet coke uh, ban which came through in north and has seen a higher uh, power and fuel expenses the expenses there have gone up which have in turn led a weight on the operational performance of the company EBITDA is down by 64 percent for this company on year on year basis disappointment has also crept in from bank of india numbers where you the company where the bank has reported a net loss of 2341 as compared to profitability and also the gnpas for the bank have gone up to 16.93 as compared to a number of 12.6% in the previous quarter. Okay, so all these stocks are some, all these stocks we will be watching out. But uh, Varang, one of the stocks that I want to speak about is uh, CG Power, that's Crompton Greaves. Uh, the, the number is not uh, the most impressive. They continue to make losses. But uh, they've tried to do a lot as far as restructure their business, sell a non, lot of non core assets. The latest one being the Hungary operations, which they have managed to sell. Uh, is, it, is it time that, you know, CG Power manages to restructure itself or turn around? Do you think it's the right time now? Well, uh, the initiatives taken by the management is in the right direction. Let us confess to that. Secondly, uh, more such steps towards uh, getting out of you know non-core unviable businesses and assets would definitely uh, bring down the burden on the balance sheet. Uh, if you are in a long haul for maybe about a year and a half or two uh, or maybe more, then my sense is that yes, you could definitely uh, you know, start accumulating the stock 
and gradually and slowly add to it rather than taking the leap at one go. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I dare say do watch out for Shelly Engineering Plastics amongst the results that have come out. I know Lumax Auto is one such stock, but you should watch out for Shelly Engineering and Plastics. Fairly decent set of numbers. It's not a very liquid stock, yes, but uh, some renowned investors, Ashish Kacholi has recently bought into it as well. The numbers were very, very strong. Uh, margins expand 380 basis points, pat up about 200%. This one could well turn out to be a stock to watch out for in the session today. But let's talk about a more liquid universe. Let's talk about trades on both the indices as well as the broader markets. Gaurav Bissar, derivative analyst at LKP Securities on the show, as well as Chandan Taparia uh, from Motilal Oswal, associate vice president at the Motilal Oswal Securities, joins us on the show as well. Gentlemen, both of you, good morning. Thanks so much for joining in. Gaurav, uh, what are you doing? We could have a small bit of an uptick on open. But the trade on Friday was reasonably okay. Nifty saw some long OI build up as well. How are you approaching trades on the index? Good morning. Uh, well, it's very difficult to trade the index for the reason that Nifty has been playing with gaps. You know, today we are opening at 70, 80 points upside. Sometimes it is 100 points downfall. So it's very difficult to play the gaps. And once you hold on for a day or two, you again witness a lot of volatility coming in. Uh, overall, if you look at the fabric of the market, it's not very weak, uh, as we had discussed earlier as well. On the other hand, I would rather buy on dips because there's a significant resistance that we see at 10,700. So if uh, if it sustains or does not open with a large gap and it opens around 10,550, then probably 10,540 can be the stop loss, 10,700 can be target. But a 100 point uh, gap up, I would not be uh, that interested to play with the indices uh, at such uh, levels. I would rather play with the options. I still feel that there's a significant resistance at 10,750. On the other hand, there's strong support at 10,450 and 10,300. So on that premise, I would rather have a, a, a sell strangle when I sell call and put combine and I uh, benefit out of the volatility that we are seeing in the market rather than participate uh, in the incremental volatility. Okay, that's the strategy from Gaurav Bissa, sell the 10,300 put and the 10,700 call. The total premium is 102 to 105, a target is 60, a stop loss at 120. Chandan, what about you? Are you, are you trading any of the key indices? Uh, expecting uh, Nifty to bounce to us uh, next hurdle of 10,650 and 10,000. 728 and these are the key uh, retracement 38.2 percent and the 50 percent retracement so after the decline of around eight percent market may test to its retracement zone uh, as a hurdle and then we start the next leg of rally so as of now expecting an up move towards 10,650 10,728 level uh, looking at the wallet index uh, it fell down by seven percent but still it it at higher level so we says to cool down below 14 30 and a half to get the comfortable ride in the market otherwise the volatile swings are likely to be there. But as of now, uh, on uh, uh, if market after the positive opening witnesses some cool down, then would uh, go for the buying uh, into the indices. Traders can opt for buying in 10,500 coal. Uh, overall, the support is near 220 and expecting this coal to head to us 200 to 210 levels. Okay, uh, Chandan, uh, what about uh, individual stock strategies? What are you recommending for today? Go with the selective heavyweights counter and what I feel that uh, it will be safe to trade in the heavyweights counter uh, because uh, uh, the volatility are comparatively lesser and the price formation are being uh, uh, witnessed. So first it is buy on Reliance industry. The stock has taken multiple support near to 868, 872 zone. Also formed a positive price candle on the weekly and the daily chart with full of buying interest. It managed to surpass immediate hurdle of 900 zone on decisive basis. So expecting this stock to rally to us 945, one can buy with stop loss on 900 level. Apart from that, SDFC twins may see some buying interest. Me mechanical indicators are recommending to go long. And after the decline of last two weeks, the stocks are turning from its oversold territory. Major price structure is positive and recent declines gives a fresh buying uh, interest and opportunity for an up move of 2.5 to 3%. So recommending to go long on SDFC bank as well with a stop loss of 1850 and expecting this stock to head to us 1933 to 1935 levels. Uh, one more trade that is on the breakout zone, uh, Bharat Force. Just a couple of days back, the stock has given the strong momentum with the breakout. It is holding well above all the previous hurdle zone. So expecting this rally to continue on higher side. Significant jump in the open interest and delivery volume also supports our positive view. Expecting this stock to rally to our 795 to 800 zone. One can buy with a stop loss of 766. And uh, Gaurav, uh, what do you have for us? Uh, what are the important stocks that uh, uh, are on your radar today? 
first uh, recommendation would be buy on Concord. Uh, firstly, the derivatives part that we have seen a 6% over addition happening. There is a good amount of long portion that we have seen. The volume, the uh, price participation is yet to be seen. So that's a very wonderful thing that we have seen OI additions happening and price is yet to see a strong up move. So it can be a, a lucrative stock. On the technical side, it's been following a channel. So it's taking strong support at the channel, uh, lower band of channel, 1300 mark. So using stop loss of 1315, a very small stop loss, one can buy a uh, conquer on the upside targets of 1360, 1380 can be seen in a day or two. Second, we buy on Godrej consumer products, Godrej CP. Uh, we've not seen aggressive long portions happening, but now there's some sort of uh, short current that has started. And if we see some long portions getting built in a day or two, then I think it can go into the another orbit. Uh, with a small stop loss of 1015, one can play for targets of 1060 to 1080. Okay, so these are the stocks that uh, Gaurav is uh, recommending and we'll need to watch out for that. Uh, hold on, gentlemen, but on to our special segment, Bloomberg uh, Jayesh Kilnani now joins us and he's drawn up a correlation between the Indian markets and some of the other peers. Jayesh, uh, what's the correlation? What's uh, exactly cooking here? Morning, Darshan. Uh, first, let's start off with uh, how the Dow Jones is correlated to some of the world indices on a weekly basis. Uh, so this is, you know, the heat map of uh, the various uh, world indices that we have. Now, what I've done is taken uh, one year into consideration and a period of about uh, 26 weeks to find the correlation. What you can see that it's most correlated to the European indices. So we have Portugal, which is, uh, you know, 0.8, uh, Switzerland, Spain, so on and so forth. Uh, but the first in, uh, Asian index that we have over here, that is the single Singapore FTSE that is correlated to the extent of about 0.7. Now remember that uh, for correlation it moves uh, in a range of minus one to plus one. Uh, plus one means that uh, both the uh, indices move in the same direction uh, and it defines the quantum. So 0 0.7 is the quantum. Uh, what you can see over here is that India is at the bottom of the panel and it is uh, you know low. It has a low correlation to the Dow Jones. Now it uh, the number stands at about 0 0.55 and if you can see that this 0 0.63 number that was the highest correlation that India had with the Dow Jones which means that means that you know so for example last week the dow jones went down about six percent while india went down only three percent so that is you know evidence of this 0.55 correlation so in India is not so much impacted or uh, you know if the Dow Jones has a has a, a knee jerk reaction India does not get so much impacted on a weekly basis. Uh, on the other hand then what I did was uh, compare how or which index indices you have to look for when it comes to the nifty index. So this is the nifty index on a daily basis it's most correlated to the Singapore FTSE which is you know 0.7. Uh, uh, the interesting bit comes in over here where you have the Japanese Nikkei uh, which is you know uh, the correlation stands at about 0.7. Um, all along, uh, we had been, uh, you know, extremely correlated with the Hong Kong, uh, uh, the Hang Seng Index, which stands at 0.59. But there are indices which move in tandem, or India moves in tandem with them, which is the Nikkei and the Singapore FTSE. So going forward, we should look out uh, for those as well. Okay, Jesh. Many thanks for putting that uh, into perspective. Um, well, let's see. Yes, last week uh, the Indian markets were relatively safe compared to a clutch of other markets. Some of the Asian markets corrected 8-9% as well. We didn't do that bad. But <coughs> let's move back to specific stocks. Um, some very strong moves the whole of last week into the metal names. Uh, even Monday's session, Tata Steel was one of the principal gainers. Gaurav Bissa, are you initiating any fresh longs into a Tata Steel, a Sale, or any of the other steel names? The Tata Steel does look a little bit interesting, and uh, we were quite... Uh, a bit when it was trading at 685, 690 levels. Even at these levels, I would uh, be having a bullish biasness, but uh, I would rather play with uh, the option side. Buying a 740 call option would be uh, more feasible to approach uh, uh, the stock for the reason that we have seen too much of volatility coming in the markets. Also, there's an incremental volatility that we are seeing in the metal space as well. So I think buying an option would be more prudent way to approach the market. Uh, Gaurav, any view on Nestle? Because uh, what I'm seeing is there was a high open interest buildup of close to 35% on Monday. The counter was up almost 2%. Uh, uh, what do you make of Nestle? The results are there today, obviously. Uh, you know, it's not actually seeing long portions getting built up. So there are spots when we see incremental long portions getting built. So there can be one positive aspect that it has been seeing a strong support at 7,000. Uh, kind of levels coming in. So I think using that as a stop loss of 6980 kind of stop loss, one can buy Nestle since it's trading at the uh, bottom end of the pyramid. And if there's 
a good overhead we are seeing getting built. I think then it can see levels of uh, 7,350, 7,400 with the red V's. So on that premise, one can have a 2% stop loss, 5 7% targets sort of arrangement done. Uh, and Chandan, any view on India Bulls real estate? The counter has managed to move up significantly uh, over the past few days. Uh, what do you make of the India Bulls real estate? See, however, we don't have coverage, but uh, looking at the technical point of view, it has recently surpassed immediate hurdle of 215, 216 zone. So now till it remains about the same, the stock has potential to retest the recent high of 263 kind of level. So overall expecting the positive bias into the counter. It also formed the bullish engulfing on the weekly chart and taken support uh, at a major trend line, horizontal trend line zone. So expecting the positive strength to continue into the counter. That's interesting. Watch out for Innable Surya State. Fundamentally, technically, uh, looks um, an interesting stock to monitor today. Um, go. Gorang, two or three mid caps or small caps, if you will, which have come out with a very good set of numbers. One of them is Lumax Auto. I don't know if you track them, but if you do, one of them is Lumax Auto, wherein the margins have expanded meaningfully. Shelley Engineering Plastics, I was just talking about it. Again, a strong margin expansion. And a third stock, not really a result based stock, but KRBL, when Pabra Investment has bought about 2.7% stake, the stock should react a bit today. But irrespective of today's reaction, any view on any of these three names? Well, unfortunately, because of regulation, uh, no, we can't comment since we don't have a conversation. Okay, fair call. Okay, KRBL though, could be an interesting one to monitor in today's session for sure. Um, you know, Shipping Corporation of India is amongst the other stocks which really shot up uh, in a big way in Friday's session. Whether on charts or otherwise, Gaurav Bissa, have you looked at SCI? It's a bit of a dead cat move, but can it extend itself? Well, if you look at uh, last few trading sessions, it has not been doing much, or last few months rather, it has not been doing much. There are multiple resistances ahead. So I would skip the name uh, as long as it's trading uh, below the levels of uh, 1992. There's a chance that every rise might be used in, as an opportunity to exit the stock. So I would not be too keen on buying uh, the stock, even though it has seen a good up move. I would not be too keen. Okay, uh, Gorang, your view on Bank of India, very poor set of numbers that came out. Uh, net interest income was down 13%, net loss of 2300 crores, and GNPA at almost 17% uh, versus 13% last time. What do you make of Bank of India? So, I think over the last two or three years, in fact, uh, we've been maintaining a sell on Bank of India, PNB, and primarily the reason is the exposure towards the vulnerable sectors and uh, deterioration in terms of the uh, numbers reported and resolution of those uh, you know bad loans or names which they are stuck with uh, i don't think they will see the light of the day anytime sooner more importantly uh, i think uh, there is a lot of news flows as far as the banking sector is concerned be it with respect to the PSU bank recapitalization or be it with respect to the change in norms uh, made by the Reserve Bank of India uh, overnight. And my sense is all those steps are in the right direction, but they will take time. There may be, you know, uh, deteriorated numbers reported as far as the evening loss and net increase are concerned. Speaking of public sector banks, Gorang, Gorang, yeah, just hold on. Gorang, just hold on to that thought. I'll come back to you for the PSU banks uh, in overall. But the pre open rates have just started. And well, for now, all over the place. But we know that if the SGX Nifty is to be believed, of course, we'll probably have a start which is about 15 20 points in the green. Not too many large companies that came out with numbers post market hours. Uh, maybe, so let's bring up two or three of them. Gale came out with numbers. Let's see if there's a reaction thereof. Britannia, not an index stock. But certainly could be, uh, I think there's an exaggerated reaction from Gale. This will cool off completely. Let's bring up uh, Britannia too and see if that is reacting a bit. Marginally higher. Let's see if there is more in store for Britannia. Brokerages have given a bit of a thumbs up to this one. And the banking name should come up on your screen by virtue of um, the new sets of regulations that the RBI has put out. So the PSU bank should certainly be in focus today. Bank of India is reacting to results as well. Don't just look at it from the other uh, one perspective. But SBI, BOB, Can Bank. Uh, PNB, all of these should come out with, uh, or, or all of these should be monitored in the in today's session. For now, the rates are well, maybe sketchy. Let's give these rates a chance to settle down, and then we'll figure out. Just want to monitor once the rupee as well. It's open at 64.17, I think, versus 64.32. Some bit of strengthening 
that we're seeing in the currency in early morning trade. I want to mark Rolta actually because that was an important news in terms of restructuring their bond. So let's see if uh, Rolta figures in the pre-open. Uh, it's up almost 1.5%. So. Uh, not all that positive. Uh, it's positive, no doubt. And let's look at Fortis also. Uh, lots of news. Uh, they have deferred their results. Um, again, you know, they're looking to buy out RHT's uh, uh, stake in the company. So lots of things. And, and KRVL will be important to watch. Uh, Monish Pabra, I bought in 2.7% stake. Yeah, that's the big one. It's up almost uh, 9%. So And Fortis had a big fall in, in Monday's session. I think 6 and a half, 7% yeah. correction too. <clears throat> see, see, Fortis, uh, it, it, firstly, it hasn't declared its second quarter number. Uh, it's time for the third quarter, so I think they will declare it uh, together. Buying out the RHT stake is uh, positive, but nevertheless, you know, uh, uh, I think one thing that people need to watch out for, whether the brothers, they have resigned or whatever happens, uh, the company cannot, uh, the promoters or this company cannot be sold until the Supreme Court gives the verdict. So, you know, people hoping that, you know, since that, you know, the Singh brothers have, have resigned, uh, the sale will happen. That is not to happen. Uh, it's only the Supreme Court, uh, once the final judgment comes in, what will happen, then only any kind of sale will happen in Fortis. Yeah, so just keep, keep these final aspects at the back of your mind if you are indeed looking to trade Fortis Healthcare. By the way, just want to mark two or three other names before we get in Summit with the brokerage calls. Um, the, a stock that's been on a bit of a roll the last two or three sessions is Mahindra Holidays, starting off marginally higher. And look out for the gas names, Mah Mahanagar Gas and IGL, both the stocks very active in Monday's session and looking like starting off with a positive tick in today's session as well. We watch out for Lumax Auto and Shelly Engineering as well. We'll check these rates at about 9.08 a.m. For now, they look like starting off positively. But Samit Sarkar is here with the top brokerage calls of the morning. And Samit, what's standing out? So first we have is UBS on Britannia. Now they have maintained their buy rating on the stock with a target price of 5,550. And the third quarter of financial year 2018, according to UBS estimates, Britannia has reported a double-digit volume growth in their domestic business for the for the first time in the last five quarters. And this double-digit volume growth is a positive surprise according to the broker. Now during the quarter, the raw material prices remained stable, which helped in profitability. However, geo, uh, geopolitical uncertainties in Middle East and Africa contributed to a slow Low growth in the international markets. Now, according to the brokerage, the current stock price is not factored in the potential upside of new initiatives taken up by the company. And going forward, according to the brokerage, the, the, the brokerage expects a volume growth momentum to accelerate further in the second half of financial year 2019 as the benefits announced in the union budget 2018 start reaching the rural customers. Second, we have as Macquarie on Shobhan. Or the, stock, the brokerage has maintained its outperform rating but have raised the target price to 646 from 603. Now, the third quarter results of financial year 2018 were in line with estimates according to the brokerage. Now, the company demonstrated a strong operating performance according to the brokerage. Now, Shobha's quarterly pre-sales number were, were at an all-time high and going forward, new launches will aid, this, aid momentum to this growth. Now, operating cash flows remain positive and strong at close to around 140 crore rupees for the company, while the company's net debt position was under control according to the brokerage. Now, going forward, new launches planned in key markets like Bangalore, Chennai, Mysore and coaching should aid the pre-sales growth for the company according to the brokerage. Mm. Thanks for that, Samit. Thanks for putting that into perspective. Um, Gail, looking like starting of the day on a positive note. But Gaurang, before we thank you, you were one, making that larger point about PSU banks and what you like, what you don't like. So, we like State Bank of India, Indian Bank, uh, Union Bank of India and Bank of Baroda. And... Uh, I was just mentioning that all these steps are in the right direction, but uh, to reflect on the balance sheet and improvement on the numbers, I think it's going to take a while. That's what I just want to make up. Yeah, that's a fair point as well. I mean, whether the NPS go up or whether there are positive reflections, probably something that is two or three quarters down the line. Well, point well taken, Gaurang Shah. Many thanks, as always, for joining us today and giving us your thoughts. Appreciate your time. Okay. Um, we first five minutes of the pre-open done. In a bit, the rates will settle down. The private financials seem to be starting off the day on a positive note yet again. At least HDFC seems to be looking okay in the session. Uh, Chandan Taparia, I, I think you have a positive view on the private financials, but HDFC individually, uh, is, is there a trade still existing afresh for somebody who wants to initiate a fresh one? Positive on SDFC Bank because recently it has uh, taken support at its rising trend line and this uh, positive formation is happening after the weakness of last two weeks 
and uh, major trend is positive and the recent decline is giving the fresh buying opportunity so expecting this stock to move towards 1933 one can buy the stock with a stop loss of 1850 levels chandan uh, today alambic pharma seems to be buzzing it's up oh, it's the pre open indicates a 5% uh, gap up uh, do you have any view on alambic pharma into its multiple support of 57 zone and again started to turn off major trend is positive recent consolidation is again providing the opportunity so expecting overall move to a 72 zone those who are holding can put the support near to 57 however that is comparatively bigger so on immediate basis 59 half 60 would be the support for up to a 70 72 levels okay devin choksi of kr choksi securities joins us right now on the show as well devin good morning thanks so much for joining in um We, we coming to the fag end of the earning season just starting off with the one large number that came out post market hours and then get your overall view what did you make of gale numbers uh, and what have been advising your clients to do within this whole oil and gas space yeah good morning neeraj i think the numbers have been far more impressive and uh, i think we have been basically remaining bullish on few aspect that with the expanded pipeline capacity that the company is carrying and the resultant volume throughput that they are getting through which i think the expected uh, income will increase i think that is now getting validated that is what we see yet i think the complete volume transmission is still not being reflected fully so i think the potential remains on a higher side for sure uh having said that i think the coming to the second point on the pso oil space uh, we believe that at this point of time still uh a lot needs to be seen in the oil and gas space per se on one side we are seeing the uh, uh the crude oil prices likely to come down soften i think from the way, from the level at which they touched at the peak level and uh, on the other side uh, you would have the margins as far as i think the refining business is concerned continuing for them so if you are looking at i think the refining business per se i think the valuation would be the one which would probably ask for taking the uh, look at the company in particular however i think in order to uh, save ourselves from the entire complexities on every aspect of it i think we still prefer to stay with likes of reliance because it's a completely integrated play wherein we find ourselves more comfortable the company has higher grms company has a feed stock change so it is resulting into better margins coming up so all in all put together reliance remains i think a relatively more safer bet more favorite bet compared to many of the oil psu companies that is where i think our focus remains i think more clear okay uh, they were just one second uh, there's some news coming in on pnb that uh, they have detected fraudulent transactions in one of their branches that's about 1.77 billion dollars so that's a big fraud that they have discovered they are working uh, and seeing what uh, could happen this is uh, in terms of uh, the disclosures to the stock exchanges so pa pnb down almost 2% but uh, devin good morning darshan here uh, what did you make of uh, the new rbi norms on banks uh, could they react much negatively to the news Yeah, Darshan. Good morning. Well, I think I was just going through this particular news, and uh, if you are required to provide for the accounts, which are re-adjusted or uh, or repositioned, as far as I think the repayment is concerned, immediately I think you have to provide for it. I think that does mean that the banks will have to provide a uh, little more in excess of what they up till now provided. That's our the uh, that is our first reading. maybe my analyst is working on the numbers per uh, bank so we will be knowing little bit more in detail after the complete workout is ready but as it looks like i think some of the psbs would once again have higher requirement of the capital and that could mean uh, government uh, talking about infusing more funds now this is relatively tricky thing that if government has to infuse more funds in a given situation uh the fiscal deficit situation could also probably i think come into play and that's what i think one is required to calculate in detail but all in all though on one side i agree that it is a clean up exercise going on for the banks on the other side the good news is that nclt led relate uh, nct led uh, restructuring process which is going on is fetching far better results and as a result of which the banks are recovering their money fast so i think the government is taking a bold call on one side they are asking them to provide for those assets where they are restructuring on other side uh, they are recovering money from the non performing assets through nclt mechanism 
uh, all in all it's sounding positive to me but let's wait and see how much i think capital requirement per company that they may have and then probably make a, a proper call on the aspect of i think requirement of funding that they would have on the capitalization side Okay, just hold on, uh, Devin. We are just about to start uh, with the markets. We are just about uh, away from market opening, and we'll tell you all you need to know to stay ahead in today's trade. Banks in will be in focus today as the RBI issues revised framework for stressed asset resolution. Sun Pharma, Allahabad Bank, Apollo Hospitals, Balakrishna Industries, Jet Airways, and Nestle are amongst the companies that will report the numbers today. Lots of companies that came out with strong numbers, Britannia, Lumax Auto, J. Kumar Infra, GSK Consumer, Dollar Industries, Merck Electronics, Shelly Engineering, Tidewater and Minda Corp. Gale, Madhasan Sumi, Bank of India, Hathaway Cables, Manglam Cement and Triveni Engineering amongst numbers uh, that, have, uh, we that have reportedly been weak in December. KRBL will be in focus as Pabrai Investment Fund buys in 64 lakh shares or close to 2.7% stake in KRB, KRBL at 594 rupees. The stock is up almost 5%. And in other news, Rolta signs pack to deal a restructured dollar bonds due for 2018 and 19, while Fortis Healthcare seeks extension till February 28th to announce their December quarter results. Okay, well, watch out for all of these as the pre-open rates have settled. I'll quickly get you what the Nifty is uh, likely to do on open today. Should come up on your screen. The well, the pre-open rates indicate about a 46-point uptick uh, for the Sensex, about a 136-point uptick. I would guess the broader market school could start off on a positive note. Uh, just before uh, we hit market open, a quick thought really on a large cap. Uh, name Gaurav Bissa from amongst the stocks that are likely to start off well, Vedanta is up about a percent and a half. Any thoughts here? Well, there are multiple relations in the uh, trade going ahead. Uh, 325, 320 is a very strong relation. A lot of option adding has been seen in theoretical call option. So buy only about 330, stop loss of 325, targets of 340. Uh, unless it does not cross, I would stay away from the name. Mm -hmm. Okay. 1 minute 25 seconds left for the market open. Let's nail it down to that one top trading idea for the day. Devin Choksi, stay on. We'll want to talk to you about a few more uh, things post market open as well, but just very close to market open. So let's get in that one top trading call from both of our experts. Chandan Taparia, to you first. Your top call for the morning. Yeah, uh, we have recommended Reliance as Gypsy Bank, but for immediate basis, I'm expecting more move in Bharat Force. So already recommended to buy with a stop loss of 766 and expecting it to head towards 795 to 800. So. And uh, Gaurav, what is your top call for the day? My recommendation would be on Godrej Consumer. I think the uh, kind of uh, participation one can expect in the name, it can head towards 1100 mark. So one can have a stop of 1015 upside targets of 1060, 1080 can be seen. Gaurav, before we start, uh, there's still some time. Any view on Tata Steel? Today, metals seem to be ruling the roost. We spoke about Vedanta. Any view on Tata Steel? Uh, Tata still looks positive, but as I said, there's a lot of uh, volatility that we see in the markets and also in the metal names. 740 call option, uh, that is a, a good way to approach the name. I would buy a, a 740 call option rather than buying a future. 740 call option should be the uh, way to approach this name, uh, Tata still. Okay, uh, 14 seconds to market open. Stay on, gentlemen. So much more to talk about. We'll start off in the green. In fact, the pre open rates indicate a fair bit of green compared to what uh, the SGA tick would have suggested. Uh, watch out for the commodity names, watch out for Gale and watch out for PSU Banks. Half a percent up for the Nifty 50 this Wednesday morning. The Nifty Bank too, well actually not as robust as the benchmark indices but still about 45 points in the green. Maybe maybe bogged down by certain PSU Banks, we'll get to that in just moments from now. The mid caps and the small caps too should be starting off with a fair bit of green. Yes, they have actually been outperforming the last three or four sessions on the upside. Today is no different, the start is not different. The heat map should come up fair bit of green actually not enough losers that's the key thing ICICI SBI access and yes so banks by and large are looking soft maybe that's why the bank nifty uh, slightly off but look at the winners Gale up about a percent and a half result reaction there the two three heavies Reliance 
HDFC, HDFC Bank. When these three are in the green, you typically have some bit of support that comes into the market. But we don't have a big gainer or a big loser on either direction. Just that corporate facing banks, Axis Bank, ICICI Bank and Yes Bank have started off in the red. Naturally so, the new guidelines, people would believe that maybe just maybe it'll be a bit difficult for some of these banks as well. But let's talk about some of the key movers that I've marked before I throw it over to Darshan for the broader market space as well. Uh, some result reactions, some bulk deals. Pabra Investment Fund has bought into KRBL and that stock starts off about 6% higher. Two result reactions that I wanted to mark, one of them was Lumax Auto, very strong, 5.5% higher, Q3 pat up 225%, margins expand, uh, all hunky-dory, margins at about 10.1%, uh, so that's all good news for Lumax, that starts off well. Shelly doesn't, um, I, I personally am surprised but anyways, the stock has run up a fair bit too, so starts off very very flat but it's an illiquid stock, be careful before you go out to buy this if you need want to. And last but not the least, some of the big movers in Monday's session, just want to mark and see what they are doing in the session today. Jay Kumar was up 14%, up 3%, L&T Tech 12%, starting flat and Shipping Corporation of India uh, was up about 12% uh, in Monday's session, starts off a percent and a half lower. What else are you spotting, Darshan? Yeah, so the endless, which is up almost six uh, percent. Uh, KRBL, the stock we spoke about, is up almost six percent. Uh, Renegade and Vakrangi locked on upper circuit uh, again. Uh, there seems to be traction. Uh, Kulte Bottle continues its good run. Edelweiss is up close to five percent, so that's doing well in trade. 8K Miles will come out with numbers today. It's up almost three uh, percent. So that seems to be doing well. Uh, you have uh, the other company, DB Realty. Realty as a package doing well. Uh, so that is something. J Kumar, strong numbers. So J Kumar has managed to inch up in trade. So that's the broader view of the markets. What's not doing well because of the large $1.8 billion fraud that they just spoke about. PNB is down almost 4%. Weak numbers from JK Tires and JK Tires is down another 3%. Bank of India disappointed with its numbers is down 2%. Uh, HCC is down 3% because you know uh, it was in the S4A uh, and uh, and since that has been now been dissolved it will be interesting to watch some of these high debt companies how they move on. Shilpa Medicare continues to disappoint. So overall it, it's a market, it's a very very stock specific market. The Nifty is up almost uh, 30 points so Neeraj that's about what I can spot right now. Yeah the Nifty Bank though interestingly is now slipped into the red so that's the key. Uh, thing to monitor as well. Uh, maybe bogged down by the corporate facing banks, but all of these have come off. Before we get in some thoughts from Devin Choksi, just a quick thought here if there is a trade here, Gaurav Bissa, Nifty Bank, or Axis, ICICI, or some of those banks? Uh, for Axis, yes, there can be a trade for a stock of 548 on the upset, as of 565. I mean, it's a small trade, that is sort of trade one can expect. And uh, ICC, I would still wait. It's been trading in a range, so I would still wait. And as Chindan was saying, that SDFC Bank is looking good. So among the private names, uh, SDFC Bank looks quite robust. And one name that I would like to add is Coal India. Uh, apart from what we have discussed, if it sustains 305, 310, then I think uh, one can expect 10, 15 percent coming in a matter of a couple of weeks. It would be very strong. It would behave like a mid cap once it crosses and sustains level of uh, 305. Wow. Okay, watch out for Coal India. Could behave like a mid cap, Gaurav, besides saying. Chandan, anything that pops up on your screen? Yeah, I wanted to discuss about Reliance as Chips being Bharat Forge, and these stocks are likely to perform the way market is moving. Mm. Okay. I think BEML has managed to inch up if we can get uh, BEML on the screen. Uh, there seems to be a lot of traction. Yes, it's up almost 2%. Let's also get in BEL uh, on the screen. I believe there was some news uh, in terms of uh, BEL. Uh, in terms of some bit of uh, Defense Acquisition Council approves uh, 15,900 cross proposal for the armed forces. So BEL, BEML will be in focus. This is something, uh, it's news based. So BEL, BEML in focus. And Fortis is pretty much slipped to the day's low, So which is trading weak. Uh, uh, it, it, it's in the positive, but has come off uh, the highs of the day. Uh, Devin, any view on Fortis? The entire saga that's going on, it's not the company specific, but it's uh, something that's working out of the company. Uh, what should one do with Fortis now? Sorry, I have no idea about this company because we don't have it under coverage. 
so excuse me for that. Okay, uh, any view on Sun Pharma as such because uh, uh, the numbers are out today. Uh, pharma as a pack, uh, most of the pharma companies have uh, uh, not shown the best of the numbers. Uh, Sun Pharma and, and uh, there is the Halol inspection that's also going on. So in the midst of uh, all these news that are surrounding Sun Pharma, what, how does Sun Pharma look? Well, I think we're not too sure about tarot, but uh, the my whole take is that uh, the inspection should get through for Sun Pharma, and that's where I think you could possibly uh, be seeing the right sentiments coming back into the company. As such, I believe that uh, the uh, domestic market performance is also improving for the company, and at the same time, I think generic product performance with a speciality generic focus, I think, is helping the company. Uh, I would think that the worst probably may be over for the company as far as I think the working is concerned and uh, we'll wait and see how exactly the commentary comes out but we remain relatively confident about uh, the Sun Pharma going forward. So any dip or correction in the price I think could be a buy opportunity at the lower levels. By the way, uh, you know what's uh, actually take a moment to thank both uh, Gaurav Bissa and Chandan Taparya for staying by with us uh, for this long. Uh, gentlemen, thanks so much for joining in today and giving us your thoughts. Really appreciate your time. Um, what's starting off well, uh, Edelweiss and JM Financial. Now, the unintended beneficiaries, if you will, of these new RBI guidelines would probably be some of the ARC companies. I don't know if that's the reason why both of these have started off well, but certainly they are doing well. Uh, Devin, <clears throat> you know, it's been a chalk and cheese performance by some of these brokerage stroke diversified financial services names. Motila Loswal was hit very badly by their housing finance business uh, mishap that happened in the last couple of quarters. But what about what about these two, Edelweiss and <coughs> AM Financial, uh, primarily because of these new guidelines and the increased business that ARCs might get? Not that they were, not that they didn't have uh, a lot of business already. Well, Neeraj, I think apart from the kind of verticals that all of these companies have created and they really have a good time because of uh, the good economic situation plus their right positioning into the product segment. But as you rightly mentioned about the ARC's business, I think this is one business which could be the trigger point going forward because this is a story for next four to five years and the companies which are well capitalized could possibly be the bigger beneficiaries. In fact, I think you have to have the combination of products. I think on one side you have the capital, well capitalized ARCs. On the other side you have to have, I think, some of the AIFs, I think structured AIF available with you who could possibly take the position into some of these companies uh, given the kind of opportunity that you have. So that one good prospect about it is, is the global market is flush with funds and they are really wanting to take bet on such kind of opportunities which are available in India. The stress assets available through whichever route that you look at it, I think the people are willing to put money into it because they clearly see a smart IRR of 20-21% going forward into this kind of an investment that they are talking about. So I am relatively more confident but honestly I think haven't put a mind on the subject as far as I think all particular ARC is concerned within the basket names which you have mentioned. So would probably look into that in detail but in general ARC space looks I think attractive with a view point of around three to five years from now. Devan Housing seems to be moving to the highest point of the day. It's up 3%. One of the top uh, FNO gainers. Uh, Devan, any view on the housing finance space? Uh, honestly, I think like, extremely positive about I think this particular space. On one side, the government's every initiative is benefiting uh, the housing finance companies. The we call it rural housing, you call it affordable housing, you call it I think RERA related regulations. Each and every aspect is definitely suggesting that the housing finance space is going to be in traction and probably you will see the growth also coming in into the higher of the 20 percent double digit growth. So certainly I think uh, remaining positive from the perspective that the growth is happening and happening at a very steady rate, I think around 20, 25 percent. Uh, selective companies like HDFC, uh, LIC Housing Finance, they are in our list also and we believe that I think they remain favorable. Uh, one should be selective because size would matter most. In current situation when the demand for housing finance would increase, in such kind of a situation the larger the size better would be the uh, earning opportunity as we consider it. So we remain relatively confident and more bullish about housing finance companies uh, in coming times also. 
Devin, uh, a pocket that's done well the last two or three sessions. Other gas companies, IGL and Mahanagar Gas both, and Mahanagar Gas came out with the results as well. But just wondering, uh, are, are the stocks pricing in the near term positives? I know the long term chart or the runway looks strong, the market will only expand and that should augur well. But aren't the valuations a bit of a stretch? They are, in fact, I think they are stretch valuations. See, CGD business, CT gas distribution business particularly, I think has a volume play to offer, definitely for sure. But I think it doesn't happen dramatically. It's more of a utility business. And for a utility business to have a stretch valuation, I think one is not fully comfortable. Quite possible that I think they may show relatively steady performance. But at the same time, as far as the stock market and the stock price is concerned, if the valuations are not on your uh, side that is attractive enough, probably I think you will not make enough amount of money out of that investment. So on business aspect, we remain positive on the CGD side, but uh, on the stock market per, per, uh, front, I feel that I think many of the stocks are adequately priced currently. So one will have to buy them in the corrections or maybe look around the opportunities elsewhere. That would be a better approach. Okay, Devin, we'll let you go on that note. Thank you so much for taking the time out and joining us today, this Wednesday morning and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank uh, you. We need to slip into a break, uh, but we're doing that 10 minutes into market open because we have a very special discussion lined up on the other side. We discuss the implications of RBI's new framework for bad loan resolution with Principal Economic Advisor Sanjeev Sanyal. That's coming up. You're watching Bloomberg Quint and we're uh, going back to the top story of the day which is the Reserve Bank of India's new framework for stressed asset management came out late Monday uh, and we're trying to understand the implications of that move. Joining us uh, is uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, Principal Economic Advisor to the Government of India. Uh, Mr. Sanyal, very good morning. Thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Uh, first thoughts, uh, Mr. Sanyal, I mean, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, the view that we're getting from everybody is that this was a natural next step now that we have an IBC in place and all of the individual schemes were in some way is muddying the waters. Uh, is that how you see it as well, sir? Yes, I mean, we had this uh, large number of uh, schemes, uh, processes, and so on, which were very, very complicated. Um, you know, um, so what we have done is we have removed a large number of these and replaced them with what is a generic framework. It's a simple, clear framework. Um, which uh, hopefully everybody can recognize and uh, implement. It's also reasonably flexible, so should there be any reason to change it, it's at least clear what we are changing. You see, the earlier scheme uh, or set of schemes uh, were, you know, they were overlapping procedures, um, uh, confusing acronyms. So now we have a, s a system that is generic, it's a framework. Of course, more things will be added into it to make it work, uh, but I think. All parties know now what the framework itself is. And, uh, you know, we already have further, further downstream the IBC process. So that has now more or less got going. So the upstream part, which is <coughs> the, um, you know, rec recognition of the NPA uh, in the first instance, that has now been uh, given some sort of a clear framework. Mr. Stalin, it's flexible, yes, but in some ways it's also fairly prescriptive, uh, isn't it? Uh, I mean, you know, there are very strict deadlines, and I'm not saying they're unjustified. Uh, you know, we've had a you know, terrible experience of the last few years, so we're probably learning from that. Uh, but, you know, uh, on banks, it's a fairly uh, sort of strict timeline to put that 180 days, uh, even in cases where you have 20, 20-odd 20 banks involved to come together, everybody agrees on a resolution plan. If not, uh, go straight to IBC. Uh, is that a little tough? Well, we'll have to see how this goes. Obviously, we don't want uh, various unintended consequences of these things. But, you know, it's uh, 180 days is not a uh, short period of time, six months, um, in which hopefully a resolution plan will be uh, put together. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, one thing is happening is very early on, you're also recognizing this. So the earlier the problem was, you spent a large amount of time simply recognizing that there was a problem. There was no central repository of knowledge which everybody got informed that there was a, a problem emerging in a certain uh, entity. So that time has already been, uh, you know, um, reduced because now, you know, very, very quickly everybody knows that there is an issue. Now, of course, you know, we need the banks also to respond quickly and come up with a resolution plan. Um, you know, you're, you're raising a, a, a valid issue. Otherwise, everything ends up in the NCLT and the NCLT gets clogged. So the whole process now has to be smoothened out. But yes, I mean, uh, you know, uh, 180 days has been put in place for the time being. And it's 
the judgment is that this is a reasonable enough time to come up with a resolution plan. You don't have to implement all of it, by the way. This is just merely to come up with one. Sure. Uh, Mr. Sanil, on that you know, specific point about reporting uh, default uh, within a week uh, for credits above 5 crore, I believe, uh, do you think the next step to that is to making this Krilk public in some ways, uh, you know, going back to what SEBI had attempted to do, which is, you know, uh, inform uh, the public about defaults in listed companies, then that was withdrawn because there was some confusion about what default is, although I'm not sure why. But now with this in place, you think the next logical step is to have that default in public uh, uh, knowledge, sir? I wouldn't presume to announce a next step. Um, this is what it is as it stands. We will see what happens as a result of it, take feedback and adjust it along the way. Uh, on the issue of what the implications are, uh, Mr. Sanil, and I'm you know, putting to you what views we've gotten over the last 24 hours or so, uh, one impression is that you will see the reported NPA number rise closer to the overall stressed asset number, particularly as accounts in that 60 to 90 day bucket uh, you know, may not be uh, able to get, get resolved in the remaining time frame. Uh, is that a fair understanding? And B, the understanding is that provisions will most certainly rise even if the first scenario doesn't play out. Let's see how it goes. I mean, um, as you know, uh, we have recognized a very large number of uh, uh, NPAs over the last <coughs> year or two, and uh, you know, various resolution processes have been put in place. Um, sure, there may be a one-time increase as you, since the recognition process has now been so much sped up and made much more transparent. But by and large, I think uh, things will settle down. It's a much fairer, cleaner system. And as I said, uh, we will see how this uh, plays out um, and uh, make adjustments if necessary. But frankly, this is, a, as I said, a transparent system for whatever it's worth. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I said, it's not as if that uh, as soon as you recognize that there is a problem, you suddenly say them straight to liquidation. There is a 180-day uh, process. Then there is a 15-day further for actually, <clears throat> you know, putting it into NCLT. Another 180 days to come up with resolution. A 30-day further um, extension, and so on. So there is a long way till you, you know, till some forced resolution is uh, happens along the way. Many forms of, uh, you know, recovery, resolution, etc., can be attempted. And uh, really, that is the part that now needs to be strengthened. Uh, Mr. Salil, uh, you know, there's also a question, uh, I can't call it a fear, but a question as to what the extent of liquidation would be with, uh, you know, perhaps a larger number of cases going into IBC, and then you start to talk about the implications for, you know, jobs, e the economy. Uh, your sense, Mr. Sanyal, on uh, the risk there, I don't know if it's possible to pin it down, but uh, do you see that as a risk? See, um, we have gone through that process already last year. I mean, where a large number of cases, very large cases, uh, accounting for two thirds of the NPAs, uh, were identified by the RBI. First, a case, twelve cases, and then another forty cases. Um, and yes, um, you know, this just these kinds of efforts may may cause some pain. Uh, but I think the one-time adjustment to taking our system to becoming much more modernized. Uh, responsive to, uh, uh, you know, uh, as uh, information uh, evolves that the, the financial system is able to quickly respond to these things. In some cases, there may also be liquidation, auction, and so on. Uh, but that is not the intention of this. Uh, the intention of this is that you quickly recognize that there is a problem and begin to work with the entity to try and resolve it. Uh, and as I said, that part has to be uh, strengthened so that, you know, as you correctly pointed out, Everything doesn't have to turn up into the IBC. Um, so that is not the intention of this. What is your uh, un sort of uh, estimate of the early experience under the IBC? I know early, early days yet. Uh, but uh, what do you think is, uh, you know, is it flowing as quickly, as smoothly as you thought or hoped it would? There are some challenges in large cases which may delay the timeline, Mr. Sanyal. Certainly, I mean, uh, the, you know, it was, a, it was a completely brand new system, remember that. Um, so in some ways, <clears throat> we had to uh, learn along the way. But nevertheless, I think the NCLT has worked reasonably well. Um, uh, even before we end, uh, you know, you actually see the end point of that process, uh, you have seen a major culture change uh, in the corporate sector and in the banking sector. Um, the banks have now become much more serious about uh, recognizing 
and providing for um, the uh, NPAs. And similarly, you've seen uh, in the, uh, you know, the, the, you know, there is a clear recognition uh, in the corporate sector that, uh, you know, uh, eternal evergreening is no longer, uh, you know, something they can expect and that, you know, um, you know, resolution of some sort will have to be uh, carried out. Um, you have seen many uh, um, uh, promoters getting rid of various uh, inefficient investments. Uh, overall, when all of this is happening, it makes the overall economy much more efficient when you, you know, carry this out. It also means that prospectively going forward, um, when um, investments are made, uh, uh, more thought will be given about the amount of capital being deployed, why it's being deployed, because remember, uh, this, this capital has other uses as well. So if an inefficient user preempts it, uh, it leads to, um, you know, it basically means that other investments were not made. So, you know, cleaning this up was very, very important. Now, you're absolutely right that, you know, during the transition, there some pain does get inflicted, uh, inflicted on the economy. We saw that in 2017 that, you know, and, uh, but, you know, it, it, the economy has now recovered from that. Uh, you can see the uh, IIP numbers beginning to come back um, and so on. So, uh, you know, uh, we have gone through the transition. We have more than survived it. Uh, and uh, in the end of the process, you'll have a much healthier banking system. Please, sir. Uh, but, you know, just the collateral damages. So one point I want to check with you, actually two points I want to ask you about. Uh, one is that do we risk, uh, risk a scenario where the banking system is very sort of averse to lending to uh, large corporates? And I hear I also point to a reform package which had been announced by the government which said that you have to limit your exposure to corporate credit at 25 percent, I think. Uh, that put together with the enormous pain that the banking system has gone through on account of corporate credit, do you think we risk a scenario where people just don't want to lend to large uh, investment uh, sort of projects or infrastructure projects? See, there's always a risk that you will swing from one extreme to the other. So, um, you know, that is a part of uh, economic management. This is not about the framework, but about managing transitions managing expectations, managing the work culture. So, yes, it's something that has, is, is an ongoing thing and it needs to be monitored and, and, and adjusted to. You, you cannot, uh, you know, uh, there is no quick formula to this. Uh, it's a risk that uh, exists. Uh, we are aware of this risk and um, we will, uh, you know, have to manage it. The other point is what came up in the economic survey, uh, you know, slightly uh, more theoretical, is that the recovery uh, in terms of the investment cycle from, you know, a balance sheet driven slowdown uh, could be very, very slow. Uh, in India's case, Mr. Sanyal, uh, you know, what is your sense of, you know, how quickly we could recover from this in terms of getting the investment to GDP ratios up, sir? Well, I'm no longer in the business of forecasting in that sense. Uh, the point is that I think the, the recent numbers have suggested that the economy is recovering. Um, the global economy is also recovering, which also is a good thing because it means that, you know, um, exports and other things will also hopefully pick up uh, with it. So, um, uh, the idea here is that as the economy adjusts to this new ecosystem of GST, IBC and so on, um, that uh, we will now be able to begin growing with the new paradigm in place. Um, the transition from that earlier paradigm to this one obviously led to uh, various um, uh, you know, friction to the system. But I think now we are in the new paradigm and we have got to make this one work. One last question, Mrs. Anil. Uh, this sort of new folk, I, I, I don't know if it's new, SME lending has existed forever, but this sudden sort of, you know, every statement talking about SME lending, you know, from the government, from the RBI, uh, uh, what's going on here? I understand the need to lend more to SMEs, uh, but there have been other issues there as to, you know, whether these companies have the required paperwork, etc., to be able to, you know, get credit from banks. Uh, it, it, do we not again run the risk of pushing too hard on you know one particular segment, uh, and it could end up you know coming in uh, you know it could be the new infrastructure if I can put it very bluntly uh, of the next few years. You see, the, uh, as you said, the, uh, the, the clean up of the banks uh, disproportionately hurt this segment for a very simple reason. Um, this segment relies almost entirely on the. Uh, uh, 
on the banking system because you know they don't have the kind of access to capital markets that larger players have. So in that sense, uh, you know, we do need to handhold them a little bit. Um, and the same thing happened with GST. Uh, unlike the very larger players, the, <coughs> they, they are not in a cap uh, very often not in a position to um, you know, hire lawyers and accountants and so on to take them through the transition. So some of them did have difficulties. We recognize this. So I think we do need to handhold them a little bit. Um, you know, in the end, the SMEs are a source of uh, resilience to the economy. They're a source of jobs, uh, innovation, and so on. So it is not unfair that we uh, put some uh, special effort uh, looking at their needs. All right, Mr. Sanya, uh, lovely chatting with you this morning. Thanks so much for stopping by to share your thoughts on uh, what's been happening in the banking space. A uh, big development, of course, on Monday. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, Neeraj, that's the word from the one key takeaway. Uh, I think you know very clearly backing this uh, next step, next Obviously major so. step. Uh, you know, um, and he said that and very honestly said that there will be some re repercussions, and we'll go through them. Uh, can't expect to come through you know such a bruising bad loan cycle without any repercussions. Uh, I think they are they too are watching uh, the early experience of the IBC to ensure there isn't too much liquidation. Mm. I think that you know, is something that we all now need to watch very closely. How many accounts start to go into liquidation? What are the implications for uh, enterprise on the ground? And it seems they're, they're prepared for this uh, near-term disruption because he said that we're going into this with eyes open. Yeah, uh, there will be some hiccups that will happen. He did. But eventually the goal will be better. Yeah, yeah. Cleaner banking system for sure, long term. <laughs> long term, okay. Well, and remember, in, in, in just minutes from now, uh, this whole chat will be available on our website as well. So if you've missed it, uh, a really interesting chat, uh, go on to www.bloombergquin.com and you'll get a slice of this conversation as well. Okay, now on to corporate earnings and a couple of numbers. Uh, Mother Sumi reported a 12% dip in its third quarter numbers. You don't usually see MSSL do that, but what have been the key highlights of the quarter gone by and how would the outlook ahead be like to answer this and give us a fine print of the earnings for the quarter gone by? Joining us on the show is the chairman, Vaik Chan Segal. Mr. Segal, good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. Can you give, take us through the quarterly performance, especially SMR and SMP, and also what kind of adverse euro impact was seen for the quarter? Actually, the sales are up uh, on a consolidated basis, 36%. Uh, and the beta is up 21%. Uh, we have some uh, very strong growth in all, all across all the segments. SMR um, uh, has uh, also grown very well. There is a forex impact of about 16, approximately 16 million euros, but uh, that's a one-time thing anyway. SMP has done phenomenally well, it's 18% up quarter on quarter. Uh, your Kashkemet plant, the Hungarian plant, uh, was inaugurated uh, by the Prime Minister of Hungary. And as well, uh, the uh, Tuscaloosa plant, yesterday we did the Greprevesh for that. So everything is uh, coming out well. Uh, Zilaltepec, the Mexican plant, is doing better and better. Uh, so uh, all around, uh, it's a phenomenal story. It's a good story. Okay, in terms of new capacities, you recently commissioned a new plant and have announced opening of three new plants as well. Can you elaborate on the expansion plans? You seem to be on a continuous spree of expansion. Uh, there are, I think, uh, uh, there are uh, three plants in India. Uh, all uh, three of them, two of them are wiring harness and one is, I think, wire plant. Uh, uh, Germany, uh, there's one new plant. In Hungary, there are three new plants, USA one. And in South Korea, we have one new plant. So these are the nine plants that are coming up in different stages of completion. With this, almost uh, we can say the CAPEX cycle would be over for the current orders that we have in hand. Of course, as we get more orders, uh, if necessary, we will set up more plants. Okay, um, we've seen increased copper and commodity prices. By and large, the trend has been upwards. How did that impact your performance? What's the outlook ahead? Yeah, definitely our, uh, our uh, performance is that much subdued because we have a three to four months time lag between uh, the time the copper goes up and, or comes down and we have to give it back to the customer or take from the customer. Well, in this case, definitely our uh, uh, PBT and all that will do better because uh, we will get those compensations coming from the customers. For the standalone business, Mr. Segel, how do you see uh, the scenario shaping up with these new plants coming that we spoke about? Can we expect 
double digit sales growth for the standalone domestic business? Absolutely, and why not? Uh, Motherson's story is not about uh, growing, uh, you know, one particular product or something. We are getting more and more uh, products, and that actually allows Motherson to grow ahead of the uh, what the growth in the Indian uh, domestic existing is there. So while the automotive industry would go three, five, ten, fifteen percent, Motherson is always a multiple of that because we are increasing content per car. So India's story is looking great. Uh, you can see the numbers coming. It's, it's amazing numbers. And uh, automatically, we keep getting uh, more and more share of that particular thing because we are supplying our, uh, our existing products and also getting into new products. So very exciting time for India as well. Okay, and lastly, for the non-automotive business, uh, electric cars, parts, opportunity, what, what kind of uh, strategy and investment plans are lined up uh, so that you can meet your... 2020 to 2025 goals? So we are doing uh, what we call uh, putting seeds into the ground for uh, this particular businesses in electric vehicles and things like that because the car makers are giving us some traction but it is not really uh, uh, going to happen today or tomorrow. So all these particular things are things which are going to happen between 2025. Uh, that means the next five year plan. So uh, for uh, 2020, our growth is all about automotives and it remains there. Uh, we have done some very interesting uh, investments for non-automotive side, but uh, believe me, in 2020, we will still be about 95, 97% uh, automotive. Okay, <laughs> of course we believe you. Mr. Segal, thanks so much for taking the time out and joining us today and all the best for the quarters ahead. That's Motherson Sumi. The stock should come up on your screen for just a brief moment. Uh, Remember, a small bit of a disappointment, but the management saying it's but an aberration. Things are looking uh, robust as usual for them. 357 is where the stock is trading. The markets too have come off a bit, I must say. The Sensex uh, in the red, uh, or the Nifty barely bobbing in the green. And the Nifty Bank, the principal uh, culprit there, about 133 points down for the Nifty Bank. I would presume courtesy the new guidelines and the disappointments that markets may be face feeling for some of the corporate facing banks. But on to more earnings, Visaka Industries, the December quarter profits jumped up. Uh, the revenue is up about 11%, a bit up 59%. So operationally, the quarter has looked very, very strong. But let's talk about what the outlook ahead uh, is like. Joining us is the whole time director and chief financial officer, Mr. V. Valinath. Uh, Mr. Valinath, thanks so much for joining in and speaking to us at Bloomberg Quint. Uh, Let's first talk about the top line growth. Uh, everybody seems to be talking about how India is in this space wherein housing infrastructure will just zoom and the demand for almost all industries which are ancillaries to these two pockets uh, will have a really good time. Uh, what Have you seen signs of that or is this 11% basically a par for the course kind of revenue number that you've posted? No, we are seeing uh, uh, a good growth. In fact, the growth uh, indication started last year itself. In fact, last year, the first, uh, first six months, we grew about 5% in the building product segment. But then after that, the demand and the GST have actually delayed the actual recovery in the books. But if you see in the last three, four quarters, in the meantime, the margins started rising. In fact, in any industry, when the upturn starts, either first the margins will start rising and then the volumes pick up, or the volumes will start rising and then the margins pick up. So we see that uptrend in the industry and therefore last, last year itself we started raising, seeing margins significantly moving up. And now this quarter onwards, I think of the GST backlog and all that being over more or less, though there are still some amount of a small, small bickerings are there, uh, but I think the volumes started really rising. In fact, uh, for the building products industry, especially for us uh, in this sector, the third quarter is not supposed to be a very great quarter. In fact, traditionally, if you see for the last seven, eight years, the third quarter will be the weakest quarter. But however, this year, third quarter has been very, very good, which means that the, we are seeing the traction uh, in the building product sector. And I think I've been tracking the results of various other companies also. I think generally, the rural growth is picking up, demand is picking up for the building products. In fact, uh, we are still at the tip of the uh, mountain to climb. I think uh, there's a whole lot of story which is going to unfold in the country. That is what we believe. And there will be a lot of opportunity for people like us. So, 
I take on board that quarter three could be a soft quarter and therefore you've given 11% growth. But I'm looking at the nine month performance versus a nine month performance of the previous fiscal. Your revenue growth has remained absolutely flat. Now, wh why is that happening? No, you don't see the revenue growth as seen in the segment results, uh, but I would like you to see the notes to the accounts in the first sheet, where because the revenues of the previous years have been shown inclusive of excise duty as per the extent guidelines. Uh, but the current year uh, with the GST kicking in, we are supposed to show the turnover net of GST. And if you see in the notes at the on the first sheet at the bottom, I've given you a note and then a table showing the turnovers comparable figures uh, for the last year as well as this year. So if you see that, then even compared to the nine months of last year versus this year, it is not flat. I think it has gone about four and a half to five percent. And uh, the current quarter, actually, when compared to the last year, has grown, uh, I think, close to about uh, 18, 19 percent. I haven't seen those notes, so thank you for correcting me. But apples to apples, you are saying quarter three, the sales growth is 18 to 19 percent. Yes, absolutely. That's and, right. And what's the contribution to that uh, in, in terms of price versus volumes? Yeah, the volumes have been growing in double digits. Actually, the cement asbestos products, one of the two segments of the building products, uh, has grown in high double digits. And the latest product which we launched, and uh, that is what we are talking about, we are trying to scale it up. And that product actually has grown by 30% uh, plus in this quarter when compared to the last year's third quarter. Of course, last year's third quarter is the demand quarter. So that is not a really robust quarter, but still a 30% uh, growth in one quarter uh, speaks for the right kind of uh, uptick in the demand that is taking place. Are you talking about Atom or ATUM, the new product that you've launched? Is that what you're talking about? No, ATU. ATUM is yet to be launched. It will be launched next year. We are okay. only doing some pilot projects right now. It is the boards, V-Next brand of products, the V-Board, V-Plank, V-Designer, V-Panel, etc. Uh, these are the products which we call as the fiber cement board business. Yeah. That growth has been 30% uh, and the domestic growth is even higher than 30% this quarter. Okay. Are you running at optimum capacity there? Because I do know that you are Prop, uh, and you are coming up with a new capacity in the state of Haryana for the v, 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 v board uh, business. That's right, that's right. See, actually for this quarter, we are almost 95% capacity utilization. The sales are, uh, I think beyond this, we can't produce. Uh, more or less, we have come to the peak. And now we are, and we have got one more quarter to go. Um, before which we can plan and prepare ourselves uh, for this ups, further increase in sales. So at the moment, as of Today, this third quarter results, if you see, we have uh, almost reached 95% capacity utilization. And uh, now we are ready to take on the additional capacity that is coming from 1st of April in Jajar in Haryana. Okay. Um, and what about, uh, what about uh, Atom or ATUM? When does that launch? Does it start contributing in FY19 itself? Yeah, FY19, it should start contributing. It's a totally innovative product. It is the first time in the country. I think world over, I think it is one of the second or so uh, that is happening. Uh, a cement, a roof come uh, solar uh, panel, uh, that is what is coming in. So you directly put this product as a roof itself and it will start generating, provide you as a roof and also a power. So this, I think, should commence uh, somewhere during the next year, first quarter. I think April, May, it should start commencing. And of course, as a new product, we are now promoting it. We are entering into tie-ups. It will take a little time for scaling it up, definitely. But I think we'll start seeing uh, uh, some amount of uh, information about this and some amount of sales and uh, adding to the uh, top line Okay. next year. Okay. So. Uh, le let me get a perspective. What do you like to like, apple to apple comparison? What's the kind of revenue growth that you believe you'll do in FY18? And FY19 with a new product, with increased capacities, uh, what's the kind of uh, revenue growth that you believe Visaka can do? The reason I ask this to you is because two or three brokerages which cover your stock believe that your compounded annual growth rate, revenue, till FY20, would be in higher single digits. They don't forecast a double digit. You sound a lot more optimistic out there. Do you believe that the volume growth or the revenue growth number for the next two or three years compounded could be in mid double digits? Should be because uh, let us discuss business by business so that we get an idea about the, what is the, going to be the blended growth. We have three businesses. One is the... Uh... Oops. Oh, I think we just 
lost out that feed. We'll try and probably just try for a minute to patch it up if we can get, or else uh, we'll anyways have to wrap it up because we're running overtime on the show as well. But I think what the management was trying to say is that their revenue growth that they forecast for for the next two years at least, FY20 I think is what we, we, the question that I asked him. Uh, the management believes that the revenue growth could be mid double digits uh, or, or the mid teens really let me put it that way so northwards of 12 13 percent most brokerages forecast about uh, the lower single digits uh, so uh, yes mr balinath i think i have you back uh, very quickly we are slightly short on time but you were trying to explain yeah. the volume growth or the revenue yeah. growth yeah, yeah, the roofing the roofing sheets business I think will grow at the rate of from six to eight percent compounded for the next three years, and the V board business we should grow at a compounded annual uh, growth rate of about twenty percent, and uh, spinning should grow at a compounded annual growth of uh, next three years at least at about eight percent. So blended, I think we should be seeing uh, some more somewhere around the double digit growth, maybe uh, between the ten and fifteen mark. Uh, the, our target is to reach about 1400 crores turnover by 2020, which means I think we need to grow at the rate of at least 15% in the next three years. Okay, and margins? I think will, that, that, that is it. Okay, yeah. and margins would be northwards of 14 because I think you've in the nine months you've done about 14.7%. Is that a good estimate? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, leaving aside quarter on quarter, quarter to quarter, because whenever, whenever a new project is commenced, initially some amount of uh, extra cost will come until the scaling gap takes place. But I think uh, in the cement asbestos business, I think the volumes are high, the margins are good and they will sustain. In the V board business, I think the margins are going to rise and uh, rise significantly. In fact, when compared to the last quarter, uh, we, we have come into double digits now, and I think it should go to much higher double digits. And the spinning also has been uh, has taken a knock because of GST in the last two quarters, and uh, now I think it has come back. So that also should clock about 14%. So I think we are looking at an improvement of margin. I think about 200 basis points margin improvement should take place in the next two to three years. So with 14 on, on top of, on top of top. Yeah, yeah. So with a 1400 crore top line and some margin expansion penciled in for FY20. Would it be safe to assume that uh, your bottom line numbers could be inching closer to the 150 crore mark? Is that a reasonable estimate? You're talking about Pat Crow, Pat? Yes. I don't think so. That is, uh, I mean, uh, too well, optimistic you've done, an estimate. You've done, you've done 51 crores on a 750 crore top line uh, for nine months. That's right. Let's assume you double the top line from 750 to 1400, 1500. That automatically doubles the pad, and we are penciling in some more margin expansion as well, right? If not 150 crores, what's a reasonable estimate? No, I think somewhere around uh, I mean, uh, 90, 90 crores. 90 crores is something which is I think we should be looking at. Uh, FI 18. Uh, it will be around close to 60 plus, and FI 19 should be around 85, and maybe 19, maybe. Uh, by 20, I think we should reach around 95. Okay. If we can touch 100 crores, it will be great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much for that candid uh, reply and congratulations on a, on a reasonably good quarter. Keep up the good work. Thanks so much for joining in today and speaking to Bloomberg Quint. That's Visaka yeah. Industries. Thank you, thank you. Speaking to thank us. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I think, but I think we are very, very bullish. I am generally very conservative in what I speak because ultimately what we speak is not important. What we perform is what's important. I think the track record, if you see, I think we have done much better than what we always estimated. Sure. And I hope that we will continue to do that in the future. Thank well, you. Um, we certainly hope so too. I'm sure your shareholders hope that as well. Thanks so much, Valinath, for joining in. With that, it's a wrap on this leg of Indian Open. Up next is the FNO Show.